the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O most holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee profoundly. I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for all the sacrileges, outrages, and indifferences by which he himself is offended. And through the infinite merits of the most sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of thee the conversion of poor sinners. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, again, if anyone is unfamiliar with that prayer, I really would encourage you to try to memorize it and offer it up every day. That is a prayer that the angel of Fatima, who is St. Michael the Archangel, uh, taught the children in 1916. So prior to Our Lady appearing in 1917, she appeared six times throughout 1917, from May 13th to October 13th. But in preparation for that, God always prepares us for things. Uh, St. Michael came and saw the children three times, once in the spring, once in the summer, and once in the fall. And he taught them those prayers, which they would actually lie prostrate for hours, praying that prayer and various others. Uh, if you want to learn more about the message of Fatima, I won't have time to go into all of it today. Um, there's certainly much more. But one resource I really do recommend, it's a great one, and this prayer that I just prayed will be found in there, as well as the other seven Fatima prayers that either Our Lady or St. Michael taught, is found in the true story of Fatima by Father John de Marchi. This has been published in like seven languages, millions of copies distributed throughout the world. I also, I love to teach, and so I often teach uh, co-ops, Catholic co-ops. History is one of the things I love, even though my background's in math and science. But um, when I taught history, we were teaching 20th century history one year. And I told my high school students, you will not understand the 20th century or the time you're living in right now if you don't know the message of Fatima. That, that's a key. It's the most important event that took place in the 20th century and even into our time now. And so this was one of our textbooks. We used this book so they could sort of understand that message along with various other lectures. And so I only mention that to try to encourage you that this is not a hard read. A 14-year-old can pick this up and read it easily. I actually have a 10-year-old that reads it and, and enjoys it. So it's not a hard book. All of us could pick it up and read it. Uh, so I do encourage you to get a copy of that. Uh, we have copies. If we run out, you could always call the Fatima Center and get more. That's just by way of introduction. To start off, uh, maybe a little unorthodox here in trying to present to you visually a meme. <laughs> it's a new thing, right? I didn't grow up with memes, but I think everyone knows what the meme is these days. So as I was preparing for this talk, uh, my wife, who finds these great memes, sent me this one. And I thought, I said, that is how I have to start the talk. So I think everyone is probably familiar with the movie Braveheart, right? It's a great movie. And if you recall, there's that one scene where they're going to have the fight, and they have the long poles, and the English are going to come charging with the heavy cavalry, right? And the earth is going to be shaking, and all the Scots are scared, and they want to run away. And, and Mel Gibson's got to keep them there, right? And he's got to keep them. So just at the last moment, they'll raise those spears, and then the horses will fall into the spears, and you know the army will be sort of decimated, the front ranks, and the Scots will win. And if you recall, Bra Mel Gibson Braveheart there with a blue pa face painted, he's telling them, hold, hold, and he keeps them holding, right? And so this meme, someone very creatively takes it, and they basically say, this image of Mel Gibson is actually the government. And then they show you the first thing, $2.2 trillion missing from the US Department of Defense. And the government, hold, 10 million, I'm sorry, 10 billion missing with the recent FTX scandal. All the money that was funneled to the Democratic Party through the Ukraine other channels, if you're familiar with that. And of course, Braveheart government is yelling, hold, 20 billion missing funneled to the Ukraine. Hold! You make a 601 Vimo transaction. Now! <laughs> it's a little bit strange to see this in our culture, but this is what's going on. And I think we all recognize the complete and utter absurdity of this. How is it possible that our government will be losing billions and trillions of dollars? Not just our government, governments all over the world. But then you, little old you, come along and make this $601 transaction, and boy, you better pay your taxes. 
or IRS agents are going to surround you. And nowadays, they're packing heat. And they're licensed for that also. And they're going to come down before you know it. You're like, what? This is actually something that has been explained as a kind of tyranno anarchy. And we're seeing it all around us today, where the government allows chaos to reign in the absolute biggest matters. Where we have an, uh, I'm from El Paso, Texas, and my parents are of Mexican descent. I left El Paso a few years ago, and I'm actually quite glad because I talked to my family and my friends that are there. And I mean, really, the, the border is being completely overrun there. It's, it's absurd what's taking place. Uh, and, and yet we do nothing about this. We're, we're fighting proxy wars all over the world. And it seems like there that can be cast. We all remember just a few summers ago, our cities were being burned, there are riots in the streets, and then the police are like doing nothing. And people are worried. They're, how can there be such anarchy reigning in the most basic, important things that the government is supposed to do? It doesn't do. It allows that anarchy to reign. But then it comes to like the smallest things. A child might not be wearing a seatbelt. Massive fine, right? You're not wearing a cloth mask over your face. Massive fine. You can't do these things. It's completely absurd. I mean, there was a lady in Atlanta, I don't know if you saw this video, where there was a riot all around her. I mean, there was a man who was on top of her car. I mean, I would be so scared in that situation. So yeah, she tries to get out of there. Fortunately, her car was still moving. She was able to get out of the, the rioting area and the people that some of them had guns and they're waving these things around. So she gets out of the way. The man on her roof, banging on her roof, falls off, doesn't really hurt himself. The police wouldn't come and help her. She gets charged because of the injury that this man actually didn't suffer. These things are happening all around us. I don't need to go and give you the current events. I think you know these things well enough. It really is pretty insane, but it's all calculated. Okay, we've got you know the, the drugs, fentanyl. These things are skyrocketing. Uh, as I said, the riots. Our life expectancy is failing. Now you've got the sudden death syndrome that we're all seeing. Again, I'm up from Cincinnati, so just a few weeks ago, Buffalo Bills in Cincinnati playing, and boom, one of the players just goes down. But that's happening all over the world with our athletes in their prime, 25 years old, and they're just falling over. We have to ask ourselves, what's going on? How is it that we're not worried about these big things, but the smallest matters get completely enforced? It, it's a way to control, and it is a way to instill fear. And it's a way for governments to perpetuate a kind of socialistic, Marxist tyranny over the people of the world. More is coming. We could talk about the finances, the economics. I'm not going to go into that too much because I think you're aware of a lot of this and what we're talking about. It is calculated. It is planned. Nevertheless, we should not fret about it. And this is why I think the message of Fatima is so important. Back to what I said a minute ago, it's the most important event in the 20th century. Once you understand the message of Fatima, you realize God told us this was going to happen. These are things that Our Lady predicted and has prophesied and has gotten us ready for. So that should bring us great consolation because God's got it all under control. Okay? And in the end, we do know who wins. The good guys win. You like our movies ending that way, probably because that's how God has got things set up. But that doesn't mean we're not going to go through a terrible trial. And what Our Lady came, especially at Fatima, to tell us is that how terrible that trial gets is a conditional prophecy. Okay, in the Catholic faith, we have certain prophecies that are inflexible that they will happen no matter what. Okay? Some of those you will find in sacred scripture. For example, hopefully, we all can recite the creed, and we know that at the end of time, Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead. All will be judged, and we'll have the general resurrection of the body. All will have their bodies resurrected. Those in hell with bodies that are damned, they will suffer more in hell because of those damned bodies that are grotesque. Read Alphonsus Liguori, moral doctor of the church, if you want to know more about that, or those who are going to go to heaven with glorified bodies in ways we cannot even imagine how beautiful and glorious they will be. 
So those, for example, are definite prophecies. That's going to happen at the end of time. St. Peter tells us this world will be consumed by fire. Okay, Noah, the whole world at the time of Noah was destroyed by a great deluge, and God promised never to destroy the world by flood. But read 1 Peter, first letter of the first pope. He'll talk about how the world will be destroyed by fire at the end of time. And of course, St. John sees the heavenly Jerusalem coming down. So those prophecies, we know they're going to happen. Our Lord has prepared us for those as well. In each gospel, there's a chapter where it's dedicated to some of these things that are happening. We call them the end times. I don't believe we're there yet. And a lot of people are talking like we are there, okay? We're not there yet. How do I know this? I know this because of Our Lady of Fatima. Okay, so Our Lady of Fatima promised that her immaculate heart would triumph and a period of peace would be granted to the world. That has not happened yet. There has been no period of peace. In fact, the 20th century has seen more bloodshed. You could add up all the lives that have been killed in the 20th century, and it is more than all the lives that mankind has existed on this earth summed up together. Okay, we have got the bloodiest century. Communistic wars, atheistic wars, wars by men who don't believe God exists. It's really sad, the propaganda. I mean, they talk about religious wars of the 1600s, and they talk about even the Crusades, and they like to say all oh, these things about that. But they pale in comparison to what has taken place in the 20th century. Again, wars really fueled by godless men. So how bad will it get? We don't know. I firmly believe that we are at the end of what I would say is an age an end of an epoch, an end of an era. I think we all just kind of feel it. You sort of know things are going headlong into this crisis, and that's why I end, began with that tyranno anarchy, just how upside down everything is. How, to, Sister Lu to coin a phrase that Sister Lucia would use, how diabolically disoriented everything is. How good is now perceived as evil, and evil perceived as good. I mean, it's so crazy now, but it's like, we don't even know the basics of natural law. What is a man and what is a woman the way God has created us? This is how sort of like completely degenerate and morally depraved we've gotten. This cannot go on forever, that long even. It's going to come to an end. But again, how bad is it going to be? So I believe we're reaching the end of an age. I'll give you a parallel. I already gave it to you. Actually, I'll give you a second one. One is Noah. Obviously, when Noah came along, there were a lot of people living, and only eight survived. Only eight people survived, and then God recreated the world from those eight. So from Adam to Noah, we have about 2,500 years, if you look at the scriptural timeline. That was the end of an age, and then a new age began. There are other ends of an age. If you think about the Roman Empire, starting around 700 B.C., fast forward to 300 A.D., it's a thousand years. For a thousand years, the Roman Empire has been around, and certainly for the last about 500 years, it's been the greatest power in the world at that time. People living at that time just thought the Roman Empire would have to exist forever. I mean, that's just the way the world was. But then it fell. It got split to the East and the West, and moral decadence took over, especially in the West, and barbarians invaded. And when St. Augustine is writing around 430 AD from Hippo, he thinks the world is coming to an end, and the people around him thought the world was coming to an end. And in a sense, the world they knew did come to an end. And we entered a new era, a new era then in which Christendom was built, in which the light of Christ came from the Irish missionaries, the monks of St. Benedict in Norcia in Italy, and they evangelized the world, and they evangelized the pagans, and we call that period the Dark Ages because civilization took a downturn, but out of it came great and glorious things. And we really reached the height of human civilization around the 1300s under men like St. Thomas Aquinas and the building of the great cathedral like Notre Dame de Chartres in France, uh, the Summa, the great works, the art, the music, the literature. It was all thriving. But a revolution has begun. And that revolution has really picked up steam. And the revolution really intensified under the Protestant Revolution. 
where they tried to throw off the yoke of the church. And it was intensified by the Freemasons in the 1700s, where they tried to throw off the yoke of Jesus Christ, thinking it was a false yoke, and trying to destroy church and state and destroy Catholic monarchies and create great chaos in the world so that a new world order could be created. And that revolution continues to intensify under men like Karl Marx and Charles Darwin, who deny the very existence of God. So man rebelling against God himself. And we see the communist revolution, and we see that ultimately that is an atheistic, godless order, where man has no soul. There is no eternity. There is no heaven. There is no hell. You're just a cog in a machine. And just like we might throw away a pen that doesn't work, or a piece of paper that can be burned in the trash, that is how an atheistic, communistic system sees human beings. Because they have no eternal value, and they have no soul. And they're just used to further the ends of the elite that controls the state. That's socialism. That's communism. And those are the errors of Russia that Our Lady of Fatima came to warn us about. And that's why we see it in full flowering now, this great revolution that's picked up this great you know, momentum over really the course of many centuries. So why we're here and why we're at this point should not surprise us as you study history. However, Our Lady also told us that it's going to get worse. There's an annihilation of nations. Nations will be annihilated. I don't think that part of her prophecy has happened. And again, this is a conditional prophecy. So how bad is it going to get? I do believe we're at the end of an age. This age is going to end. How terribly, I don't know. The good news is that at the end of this age comes the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. And God will grant us a period of world peace like we've never seen before. And there will be a great and glorious Catholic restoration. And there are numerous prophecies that talk about a Catholic monarch and a good holy Catholic pope that work together. And even a great ecumenical council that will come that will far outshine the Council of Trent and put things in order. That the Mohammedans will be converted. Because again, if Our Lady promised a period of world peace, if we think about that, if church and state are always at odds and are separated and divided, and church and state are not working together, the Pope's taught that for the social body, the soul is like the church, and the state is like the body. When we're a collective community. And we all know that when you separate the soul and the body in a person, that's death. If you try to separate the soul from the body in the social unit of society, if you try to separate church and state, that's the death of a society. It is inevitable. It is our Catholic faith. Or if you try to subsume the church to the state, which is ultimately what happens in pagan cultures, and in a communistic culture, they might allow religion to linger, but only to serve the interests of the state. It's just one more tool to use to control. That too is the death, because if you allow your soul to be controlled by your body, and by the whims of your body, and by the pleasures of your body, we know where that path will end. It will not end pretty. All right? Our soul, our mind and our will, that's our soul, our mind and our will, our mind that knows the truth and our will that chooses the good, have to ultimately control and discipline and guide the body. We're coming up on Lent real soon. That's what Lent's all about ultimately also. That's why we have Lent every year, to remember that and to control those passions of our body. That's why we fast. That's why we pray. That's why we give alms. Because that undoes all the seven capital sins within us. But again, how soon will we listen to the message of Our Lady of Fatima? On that depends how this all plays out. In 1929, so now let's get a little bit more to the heart of the message. Again, I cannot spend too much time on this, so I'm going to try to give you just a really, really brief rundown. As I already mentioned, in 1916, the angel came and visited him thrice. That's St. Michael the Archangel. And there's always a reason why God does what he does. He sends St. Michael because Michael is ultimately the guardian of the church. He is the guardian of the papacy. And he is the leader of God's militant armies that ultimately thrashes Satan. 
casts them down out of heaven when he rebels against God and says, non serviam, I will not serve. Okay, so it's very critical, it's very important that St. Michael is the one picked to come and prepare for this message because we are headed towards this kind of cataclysmic war in which the forces of hell have been unleashed and we're going to need St. Michael's help and we're going to need our general's help who is the lady dressed in battle array as the Psalms will tell us. That's our Blessed Mother. She crushes the serpent's head. That's predicted in Genesis 3.15. Again, a prophecy that is inflexible. God's divine will. That happens. It is Our Lady who crushes His head. And you see it throughout the Old Testament. There's a great book back there. I think it's the best book I've read in 15 years, not written by someone with an ST in front of them. Uh, but it's uh, by Father James Mauds, and it's called She Crushes His Head. And he just goes through so many Old Testament passages showing you how time and time again these great women of the Old Testament are actually prefiguring Mary's victory. It's, it's phenomenal. It's, I mean, I studied scripture, I have my master's in theology, and the things he was saying in that book, I was, it was opening my eyes to a whole new appreciation and understanding of the scriptures. So, I mean, I highly encourage that book, as well as this other one that deals with the same thing, but except it's the crucifixion and how the crucifixion is in every page of the Old Testament. So Our Lady is going to crush his head. We already have that. That's part of the message of Fatima because of that great revolution. So in 1917, Our Lady came six times. Uh, she has three more crucial visits that people often forget. So I'll just run through the six Again, this book is great because it'll give you a much more first-hand knowledge of the events taking place. Her first apparition was May 13th, 1917. Again, oh, don't worry. God's, God's plan is perfect. So we all should be asking ourselves, well, why did she come on May 13th, 1917? Why not some other day? I can give you several reasons. I'm not going to say I've got them all because, again, God's infinite in his wisdom. But these are some very important ones to consider. Obviously... She comes to warn about these errors of Russia spreading all over the world, which, which they have. I hope you realize this. I mean, I love my country, but unfortunately, right now, as I see what's going on in the world, the errors of Russia are more prevalent, more oppressive, and they permeate our country more than they actually do what is now the political entity known as Russia. They're having Christianity flourishing over there. They're building churches. They've got modest dress over there. They're outlawing unnatural vices and sodomy and things like that. Their drug use is still high up, but it's going down. Their abortions are still high up, but they are going down. And the churches are being built there. Now, they still are in schism, so they have not converted. Okay? They still have some ways to go. But I can see how God is planting the seeds. They've suffered a lot. There's a lot of people that have died for the faith in Russia over the last 70, 80, 90 years. And we know that the faith is always grown and founded upon the seed of martyrs. And that goes back to sayings from the church fathers in the 200s. It's not going to be any different. So you can kind of see that taking place in Russia. So they're not there yet, but they're clearly being prepared for something. And that's the fulfillment of the message of Fatima, in which Our Lady promises that once Russia is consecrated, well, we'll get to that, the two things. Let me get to that in this message. But that Russia will be converted and when we talk about conversion, realize that means into the one true holy Catholic and apostolic faith. Okay, there is only one faith founded by Christ with the Pope as the head. And conversion, when Our Lady talks about it, means you're coming into full unity with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. that traces itself all the way back to our founder, Jesus Christ, and the 12 apostles. Okay, so they're not there yet. They are in schism. But at least you see some kind of Christianity there a little bit more than you even see in our country. I mean, we have people that are, you know, supporting, uh, just praying outside abortion mills. And the FBI is coming at them, right, in their home, invading their home and dragging them off like they're some kind of terrorist. It, it really, again, back to that anarcho-tyranny. Okay. Um, so back to the six visits. Why May 13th? On May 5th of 1917, Pope Benedict XV was at wit's end because he could not stop World War I. And he saw Christian Europe, brother against brother, Christian brother against Christian brother, just killing themselves in the battlefields. I mean, World War I was truly an atrocious thing, called the Great War for a reason. And his he was actually elected because he was a very able statesman. And they thought maybe he could help the situation in Europe at the time. He can't. And so he pens a letter to our Blessed Mother. And he calls her the Queen of Peace. And he alters the litany. He adds, Queen of Peace, pray for us. 
So he adds that at the end, and he has this letter read in all the churches in Rome on May 5th. A week later, Our Lady appears in Fatima. And what does she do? She promises the war will end. and There will be peace. It's a direct answer to the Pope's prayer. It's a quick answer. Our Lady didn't waste that much time. Obviously, by then, she was also warned against the heirs of Russia. The Bolshevik Revolution is going to hit Russia just weeks after the miracle of the sun. So the miracle of the sun will take place on October 13th. And within a matter of a couple of weeks, that's where the atheistic revolution led by Lenin and then by Stalin and the others is going to just overturn Russia. And there's going to be massive bloodshed over there. So again, perfect timing. And then there's another powerful connection because May 13th was always the feast day from time immemorial where the Holy Veil of Veronica, one of the precious relics of our Lord. You know about the Shroud of Turin. The Veil of Veronica is another that has impressed the holy face of Christ on it. And May 13th is the feast day of that veil when the popes would always bring it out and present it to the world to venerate. When Our Lady revealed, when Our Lady, when Our Lord revealed that devotion to Sister Maria de Saint Pierre in the way that we know with the particular prayers of the Holy Face, the year was 1847, just one year before Karl Marx would write the Communist Manifesto, and then the entire Europe would be engulfed in revolutions from then on. And He promised Our Lord that this devotion would be the defeat of communism and of revolutionary men. And so he gives us a solution right before the errors come. But, but we didn't do it, by and large. We didn't do it. And so the revolution grew and got worse. So then Our Lady comes at Fatima and gave us the solution. And still we're not doing it. And still we're not doing it. And so things are getting worse. And I am here to tell you that, that I mean, that's the tough part of the story. The tough part is that things are going to continue to get worse. They are not going to get better. They are going to continue to get worse until we get our act together and obey God and obey our Blessed Mother. And there is no other solution. There is no military solution. There is no political solution. There is no economic, financial, social. There is no solution left. There's no human solution possible. Hopefully you can kind of just perceive that. That these things are way beyond our capability at this point. But nothing's impossible for God. And God can turn things around like that. And He does. And when he does is to his greater glory. One thing I take comfort in, it was interesting, I was talking to a priest, and I don't know the specifics. I wish I could remember the game that he was talking about. It was hockey, and I'm not even that big of a hockey fan. And he was present at a game, and I'm pretty sure it was a game seven of the World Series. And so he's in the stands, and he's watching, and his team is losing. You know, I don't know, maybe it was 3-0, 4-0. I mean, some score that you kind of know you're not coming back from in hockey. And, uh, And even the people started leaving the stands. We know how that goes, right? Third quarter, so everybody's leaving. And, and then his team mounted this great comeback and ultimately won. And so he says it was exhilarating, right? And he loves that game. And years later now, 20 years later, 30 years later, he still just loves popping in the VHS. So we're dating ourselves, all right? He pops in the VHS, and he loves watching this game. And now, you know, in the first quarter, in the second quarter, when they're scoring their goals, he's relaxed, he's calm. In fact, he's relishing those goals. In fact, now he wishes they had scored a few more because the defeat would have been so much greater, right? In fact, you know, when we have, I mean, just recently, a few years back, we had that Super Bowl between, it was the Patriots and Arizona or the the Falcons, Atlanta, right? Everybody thought Atlanta was going to win, and then they just fell apart. And then that's the great discussion later on people talk about, right? They'll always ask, so did, like, the Falcons fall apart, or was it just that, you know, the Patriots did this great thing? And you can go back and forth, and maybe it's a little bit of both. But, I mean, we love these sort of great overwhelming odds. And what do they do? They talk about how great something is, right? Because this team came back from such a great deficit, like they are such an amazing and great team because they could overcome such a powerful deficit. And the other team, of course, boy, were you humiliated. Boy, do you look like you have egg on your face. This is what's going on right now between God and the devil. Okay, this is why God is allowing the devil to do all that he does. The devil is just racking up the score. It might be 100 to 0. It might be 150 to 0. It doesn't matter. God's going to win. And the more the devil racks up the score, and the more it looks like he has complete victory in his hands, the more humiliating will be his defeat when the humble handmaiden crushes his head. Okay? And the more that God and Our Lady and her Immaculate Heart will be glorified and honored by that. 
So, I mean, that's kind of like a, a, a sort of a natural analogy, a human thing I think we all understand, at least with sports, to understand what's going on in sort of the cosmic, theological, divine providence way of things. Okay? So don't despair and don't get sad and don't lose hope when the score is being run up. I mean, every time I see a new piece of news coming out of maybe the Vatican or this or that chancery or, you know, from the different governments, our White House, our Supreme Court, what have you, whatever it might be. And my wife and I just turn to each other and say, God's just letting the devil run up the score. And we know what that means. We know that that means God's glory will be greater. But we also don't really like that too much. I mean, I'm not that comfortable with that. I, I like to get along with winning now. I, I like to get to the point where we can start scoring and we can trounce him. And yet we have the solution. Our lady has already given it to us. So that's just what we have to do. We have to do it. And then we have to tell everyone about it and we have to get really serious about this. Because ultimately this is about obeying God and doing what God has asked. I mean, fundamentally, that's Adam and Eve disobedience. They disobeyed God. They did not follow God's plan. They thought they could do it on their own. And where did that get us? Well, that got us into original sin and all the way down the path to where we needed Christ to come with the crucifixion to save us. Our Lady in Christ, of course, obeyed God's will. Not my will, but thy will be done, they say. And as long as we keep trying our human solutions, it's not going to work. I mean, have we not learned this? Are we this thick-headed that we can't figure that out? Our human solutions are not going to work because we're sinful, fallen people. We're a mess. We can't solve anything on our own, really. We need God, and blessed be God for that. And he's willing to help us out, so we just have to do what he says. And that's all of us, from the littlest person to the highest priest, bishop, and pope. We just have to do what she says, and then she's going to take care of it then she's going to fight. I mean, if you look in the Old Testament, they're, they're vastly outnumbered, and they're going to fight, like King Jehoshaphat. Go look at uh, 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. It's a great scene. One of the good kings, he's going to get defeated, but he offers a beautiful prayer to God, a humble prayer to God. And then what happens? At night, he's marching his army, and the bad guys just turn on each other, and they all kill each other. By the time they get there, the battle's over. They don't even have to fight. It's like Jericho when they march around the walls and they blow the trumpets. These things really happen. And the walls come crumbling down. And then all that King Joseph had did, he goes in there, he picked up all the spoils of war. Just like if you read it carefully with the Exodus, when Pharaoh finally lets them go and they march out, a lot of people forget this line, as they're leaving, the Egyptians are like only too happy to get them out. They're like, leave, come into our house, take all the gold and silver that you want, just leave. And so the Hebrews walked out with all the wealth of Egypt, the most powerful, the superpower nation back at that time. That is God's mighty right hand. We have to have this faith. We have to believe this. And that will, it will be seen again, like in our times, in our days. That's how we're going to get out of this. We've got to believe and we've got to obey. It's just like all those personages in the Old Testament did. And it's not just the Old Testament. It's Christian history. Time and time again, the Battle of Lepanto, the Battle of Vienna, the Battle at Malta. I mean, that is the story of our faith. We have to believe and we have to obey. The veil of Veronica is involved in that because that's the way that God's enemies are crushed. The holy face is what crushes uh, the enemies. I actually gave a talk last night on the holy face, so I won't go into that. But it will be on our website, so you can watch that and kind of fill in this part there with the veil of Veronica. In June, on June, 7, on June 13, 1917, the second apparition of Our Lady... She revealed her immaculate heart. Okay, and that ultimately is what Fatima is about. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I'm going to say that is the moment when Our Lady revealed her immaculate heart to the world, June 13th. In, in many ways, I think that's the most important apparition because of that. That is the solution, and that is the answer. It's the immaculate heart of Mary. Uh, July 13th, I think people know that because that's when she gives them the great secret, which has three parts. The first part was the great vision of hell, the second part is when she talks about devotion to her Immaculate Heart. And the third part, well, part of it was revealed on June 26, 2000. It was a vision. And the other part still remains hidden, still has not been revealed, even though it was supposed to be revealed in 1960. But we have a really good idea of what it says, though. And on Tuesday, when I was up in Virginia, I was talking about that. So if you want to know more about the third secret, you can also watch that video when it comes out. August, they were kidnapped by the Freemasonic mayor of Orem nearby. Uh, and they did let, let go, so Our Lady appeared late. And she even promised that if they hadn't been kidnapped, the miracle of the sun would have been even greater. And then September was a time to prepare, to pre-announce the miracle, so that everybody would know. That's unheard of. Okay, miracles are not pre-announced. To the day and to the hour, 
She told them a miracle would take place so that all would believe. So she tells them October 13th at noon. So of course we know that at least 70,000 pilgrims gathered there, possibly even 100,000. And the miracle was witnessed miles away, even by unbelievers, even by people who came to sort of discredit the faith. They had to admit a great miracle took place. And so then October 13th, that was a great miracle of the sun. There's more associated with that. Visions that Sister Lucia saw of the Holy Family, of our Blessed Mother. The miracle of the sun is really something phenomenal because it prefigures what's going to happen. And so if you're familiar with the miracle of the sun, first of all, this world obviously depends on the sun. We can't live without the sun. The sun gives us light. And the sun is very constant. You all can look at your phones right now and find out what time sunset is tomorrow and what time sunrise, is to, sunrise and sunset are tomorrow. That's how constant it is. We can set our clocks by it, and we do. And so they look at the sun, and you all know you can't look at the sun too long. You know, you'll go blind if you look at it. And so they begin to look at the sun, this life-giving force that our world depends on, and they can look at it, which is very unusual. It's almost like being able to look on the glory of God, which man is not supposed to be able to do. That's why we veil things in the church. And then the sun begins to act very strangely, erratically. It is unhinged from its position in the celestial dome. And it begins to gyrate in very unusual ways and give off very unusual colors, the colors of the rainbow. And people are mesmerized by that. They're sort of just stunned looking at this display of unusualness. It reminds me a lot of what's going on today. People mesmerized by things that are very unusual that should not be taking place in our church, in our governments, everywhere. And then, and then the sun came crashing to the earth. And the people were sure that they were going to die and that the world was going to be destroyed by fire, that the sun was going to collide into the earth. And many of them fell down on their faces and began doing open confessions right then and there, mea culpa, mea culpa, for their sins. And just before the world was destroyed to their eyes, suddenly the sun just, boom, went right back into the sky, right back into its normal place. No more strange colors, no more gyration, nothing unhinged, everything right as it was supposed to be. And the people recognized that their clothes, which had been so muddy and wet because it had been, day, it had been raining for days, their clothes were clean and their clothes were dry. It left an actual tangible thing that they could see. There was a miracle that just took place, and nobody who was there doubted a miracle had taken place. That prefigures, I believe, what's going to happen. We're going to get to a point where it looks like everything is over, and the world might be destroyed by fire. And at the last second, God steps in and stops it. Again, it could happen sooner if we obeyed, but we haven't. So are we going to get to that point? That's God's warning. God warning, this is what can happen. I hope it doesn't get to that point. And sometimes I wonder if it will. But we could act sooner. And so then there are three more visits that a lot of people don't know about with Fatima. But they're very important. Because in October, in July of 13, in July 13th, 1917, Our Lady promised these things. So she told Sister Lucia, I will come back and request these things. So she came back on December 10th, 1925, when Sister Lucia was at Pontevedra. And she came back on... June 13th, 1929, when Sister Lucia was at the, car, uh, at the convent in Tui. So we call these the Ponte Vedra and Tui revelations. Let's go back real quick to the second secret, because the first secret is the vision of hell. Read that description. In the second secret, what Our Lady said, it, well, we shouldn't call it second secret, the second part of the great secret. She says, to save them, to save us, God wills to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. And so that's really the essence here. Okay? God wants to save us. He does. But he has predetermined how he's going to do it. And it's through devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So that is what we all need. If, Our Lady continues, if what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. Shachi goes on to talk about how there will be a world war. That's World War II if we're not obeyed. She says, God is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. We've been living in those times. To prevent this, I shall come to ask. I shall come to ask. So she's saying, I'm going to come back to ask for these two things. So she says, to, pre to prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on first Saturdays. 
So that's the solution. This is how God is going to establish devotion to her Immaculate Heart throughout the world. By two means. The consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart and the first Saturday devotion practiced every month. She then continues, if my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and Russia will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. So that's the second secret. So we are living in that time right now, and that's why there's a great urgency. These things will happen, but the conditional prophecy is how bad will it get? How bad will the persecutions be, the wars, the famines, how deeply the errors of Russia spread throughout both the church and the world? They're getting bad, but they can't get worse. I can't even imagine how they're going to get worse, but I know they're going to get worse. Ten years ago, I didn't know how they were going to get worse, and I look and I'm like, boy, they got worse these last ten years. And so it's not in my imagination. I do not have the diabolical mind of Lucifer to figure out how it's going to get worse, but it's going to get worse. And it will continue to get worse. So for the sake of ourselves, of our children, of our grandchildren, like we need to get the ship righted. So in 1925, she comes, and that's when she asked for the first Saturday devotion. She said, practice the first Saturday devotion every month because there's so many sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary that reparation needs to be offered. And it's not just for sins that you and I might do. It's for the sins that the world is doing. God is the God of justice. Great mercy. That's why he gives us Fatima, but great justice also. And so for every wrong that is committed against his mother, it must be righted. Reparation must be offered to her immaculate heart. And the most powerful weapon by which we can offer this reparation is the first Saturday devotion. So we should practice that first Saturday devotion. And then just, and that's receiving Holy Communion on our first Saturday. That's what she asked, to offer that communion as reparation. And then really just to like sweeten the deal even more, she emphasizes all the Catholic aspects, she says, but if on first Saturday, and you do this five times in a row for each first Saturday, just five months in a row, if you pray the rosary, spend 15 minutes meditating on the mysteries of the rosary, receive that communion, go to confession, and offer those things in reparation of the Immaculate Heart. So the intention is very important. You do that five Saturdays in a row, she promises I will grant you the graces necessary when you die that you will not go to hell. You will be saved. It's like, there's such a great promise. I actually tell parents all the time, when your children make First Holy Communion, they're still pure. They can still do really good confessions at that time. It's like your solemn obligation. Have them do five First Saturdays. Like, that's when we parents can actually kind of control our kids more. By the time they get to be 17, 18, 21, 30, shh, kids are going to do what they're going to do. We all know that, and maybe we did it ourselves. But when they're seven or eight, you can take them those first five Saturdays. Don't let anything stop your family. No vacation, no job, no nothing. Get your children those next five Saturdays. If your grandparents try to do those, that for your grandchildren, get them to receive Holy Communion on the first Saturday. Have them go to confession. Pray the rosary with them and give them a 15-minute meditation on the rosary. And if you do that five Saturdays in a row and you offer that intention, then Our Lady herself is promising that soul will not go to hell. There is no greater gift we can give our children then it doesn't matter how crazy the world gets or how wayward they might go. It doesn't matter if they suffer you know, false divorces and get into drugs or get thrown into jail or abandon the faith, God forbid, or try to change their sex, their gender, anything like that. It doesn't matter. Our Lady's going to save them. It's in her hands. It's her promise. She doesn't fail in her promises. Can we do our part? And all of us should be doing the first Saturday every every single month. I often say this, if I was a bishop, which of course I never will be, I'll never have holy orders, but if I were a bishop, I would tell my diocese, first Saturday is a holy of obligation. I want every Catholic of my diocese going on first Saturday. That's it. Because bishops do have that authority to declare holy days of obligation. That is within their power. I'm not a bishop, so I can't do that. But in my family, I am the father and I am the authority and I can say it's a holy day of obligation for us and we're not missing it. Because even after we do five in a row, great, we took care of our own soul. But there's a thousand and a hundred thousand and a million other souls. And there's people I love. There's nephews and nieces and sisters that, I mean, I don't know. How are they going to get saved? I can't do it, but Our Lady can. So practice that first Saturday devotion. We've got booklets on that in the back. 
So you can get more informed. We've got videos. You can learn more about this. I'm just giving you the introduction. On July, on July, on June 13th, 1929, then Our Lady appeared, and she appeared at Tui, and Our Lord appeared, and they gave Sister Lucia a great theophany, a great insight into the mystery of the Holy Trinity. But that's when Our Lady and Our Lord said, now is the time for Russia to be consecrated. And so on June 13th, 1929, Russia should have been consecrated. And Lucia gets that message ultimately to the Pope, Pius XI, through her bishop and her spiritual director, her confessor. And it's not done. I mean, just think about how different this war would be if that had been done. There would have been no World War II, no Korean War, no Vietnam War, no sexual revolution of the 1960s. Uh, you and I would be living in a period of peace. I mean, talk about a different world. So these are the conditional prophecies. Like this is the score being racked up on us. There are consequences for this. There are eternal consequences for some souls that are falling and being lost in hell. And that's why we have to get back and we have to get this done. I don't know, this is just me now purely speculating here. So this is not, it's just me speculating. There does seem to be something interesting about a hundred years that God gives us before the hammer really falls. Uh, if you read the scriptures, you'll read that Noah spent a hundred years building that ark. I mean, can you imagine how people thought he was crazy? Right? He's in the middle of the crescent, uh, the fertile crescent. There's no ocean around, and he's building an ark, this giant ark. Anyone comes up near where I live, they've rebuilt a replica of the ark there. It's a pretty impressive thing to see, but you see its size. I mean, I'm thinking for a hundred years, this man and his three sons are laboring on this ark. Everybody must have thought he was crazy, but he had a lot of faith and he persevered. And when the hundred years were up, that is when the floodgates were released and the waters came and the people were lost. Our Lord himself drew a connection with Sister Lucia to the Sacred Heart Promise. So very similar with the Sacred Heart, Sister Mary Margaret Alacoque, he asks for the first Friday devotion, right, to offer reparation to his sacred heart that is being offended. So you see the parallel. Now we got the first Saturday devotion offered in reparation for sins against the Immaculate Heart. The Immaculate Heart and the Sacred Heart can never be separated. Mystically, the saints will tell us it's really just one heart. That's how close united Our Lady is to our Lord. And really what he wants for all of us. I mean, once we get to heaven, if we get to heaven, those who get to heaven, I mean, your heart is going to be united with Christ in this amazing way that you can't fathom right now. That's why we have to be devoted to the Immaculate Heart. To be devoted to the Immaculate Heart obviously means you love the Immaculate Heart, but the highest form of devotion is imitation. So as you grow in your devotion to the Immaculate Heart, your heart will become more like the Immaculate Heart. You will take on Our Lady's purity, Our Lady's humility, Our Lady's obedience, all the perfect virtues that she exemplifies, for example, in the Mysteries of the Rosary. Hence, it's so important to pray the rosary every day and meditate on the mysteries of the rosary so that we can begin to imbibe those virtues of Our Lady and make them part of ourselves and make our heart more like her immaculate heart because her immaculate heart is what God loves the most. God wants all of us to have an immaculate heart like his mother. That's why devotion to the immaculate heart is so important. If we're devoted to her immaculate heart, our hearts will be like hers. Well, then obviously there's going to be world peace. Obviously, we won't have this separation of church and state. Obviously, we won't have these schisms in the church. Even the Muslims will come on in and get devoted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and join the one true holy Catholic and apostolic and Roman church. That's what's coming. Like, let's get a move on it. We've got to do this. So, oh, back to the Sacred Heart. So, in 1689, our Lord asked Sister Mary Margaret Alacoque, tell the King of France, the Catholic King of France, that I want France consecrated to my Sacred Heart. I want him to put my Sacred Heart on the flag to show it's consecrated. He can put all my sacred heart on his, on his arms, on his weapons. And I want him to have a mass offered. The kings had a lot of liturgical power in those days. Have him do something at the offertory. Have him do something publicly to consecrate France to the sacred heart. And then that will make France this great, glorious nation. Well, the king didn't do it. And for 100 years, the kings of France don't do it. It's interesting because that's the period of time, we who know our American history, when France and England are having the great wars over this continent. Had France been consecrated to the sacred heart? France would have won those wars. And the whole continent would have become Catholic over here. We would all be living in a country and continents would have been Catholic forever. And then, you know, England had a worldwide empire. The sun never set on the British Empire. That would have been France's empire. And the Catholic faith would have been everywhere. The revolution was already at work. The French kings failed. And so in the end, they got their heads chopped off. They lost their throne. The French Revolution spread its errors. And we're still living under the cloud of the French Revolution. Because the king of France and his advisors, including clergy, did not heed our Lord's request. 
And so in 1931, just two years after 1929, at Rianjo, Spain, that's where Sister Lucia is, our Lord tells her, tell my bishops, my pope, not to delay like the kings of France, lest they may suffer something similar. And that was already 1931, just two years late. So our Lord himself draws that parallel, which leads me to think, this is a speculative part, maybe there are just 100 years that we have. And now, I mean, I was saying this back in 2009, but now I'm really seeing it because 100 years of disobedience to the first Saturday devotion will be December 10th, 1925, uh, 2025. Will something happen around that time? I don't know, but it certainly looks very plausible. Things could get a lot worse. How many of our parishes do we have the first Saturday devotion being taught and promoted? By and large, we're not doing that as Catholics. And so we're all guilty. We're all guilty in part. It's not like we can just turn and point the finger at the other guy. Am I doing the first Saturday? Am I doing what I can at my parish to promote it? And then 100 years after June 13th, 1929 is going to be June 13th, 2029. I don't know what's going to happen then, but that's going to be 100 years of disobedience without the consecration of Russia, without Russia being converted, and without this period of peace. Will things get worse? And then one day, just on a hunch, it's like a year ago, maybe two years ago, I forget when I did it, but I just put those two dates into a Google calendar, which you can do, right? You can calculate the exact time between any two dates. You know what the date is between those two dates? I kept wondering, why December 10th? I knew July 13th. There's a lot of reasons for June 13th. I'll talk about those in other talks. I'm not going to get into it today. But, um, but I didn't understand December 10th until I did that, and then it turned out to be exactly three and a half years between those two dates. So hopefully those of you who are familiar with the book of the Apocalypse and other prophecies, Three and a half years is always a time of terrible trial that God gives when things get really, really bad. Now, after those three and a half years, you know, it ends, and, and like Antichrist is going to have three and a half years to reign. That's at the end. We're not there yet, but that's, that can be foreshadowed. It can happen again and again. That's how prophecies work. They don't just happen once. They're repeated. Are we headed towards something like that? I don't know. I'm not a prophet, so I can't tell you that for sure. That I don't know. I don't know how the conditional prophecies are going to work. Nobody really does. Only God knows. But we do know what, we, what we're being told. We've been told to obey. We know we haven't obeyed. And now history itself should show us, just like it should have shown the kings of France, we're getting worse and worse. And there is no human solution left. So I conclude by simply encouraging every single one of you, please live the message of Fatima. It's really simple to remember the message of Fatima for yourself. I like mnemonic devices. And so one we came up with is Roman Catholic SOS. Should be easy, right? You're a Roman Catholic. You got to be a Roman Catholic to live the message of Fatima. And we're sending up an SOS to heaven. I like it too, because when you think SOS, I think boats. And of course, we know that the church is considered the bark of Peter. It's like a boat. And if you know the dream of St. John Bosco, one of his famous dreams, it's very connected to this, where the boat is a church and is being attacked and the pope gets killed, and then a new pope comes, sort of surprising everyone, because all the enemies of the church were rejoicing in victory. And when this new pope comes up, he attaches the bark of Peter to two big columns rising up. One is the Holy Eucharist, and one is the Blessed Mother, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And when he ties it to those two, the seas are calm, and all the enemies go against themselves and destroy themselves, and they're done. And it's over. And then calm comes back, and all the little other you know, bishops that were guiding their churches come back to the main church, the unity of the church once again. That's St. John Bosco's dream. It's connected with Our Lady of Fatima, I'm sure. And so when I say RCSOS, Roman Catholic SOS, I think of all that. I think of us getting tired. So Roman Catholic, that means obviously you have to be baptized. Obviously you have to cease offending God, which Our Lady of Fatima says. Don't be committing mortal sins. Stay in the state of grace. That's like baseline minimal Catholicism. So that's what we should all be doing. Okay? So that's the Roman Catholic part. And then come the five things. So the R stands for the rosary. At every one of the apparitions, Our Lady said, pray the rosary and pray the rosary every day. Um, we give a whole talk on the rosary, especially the fact that it has more power today than ever before. They may take a lot of things from us. They could even take the mass from us. They could put us in concentration camps. They could put us in gulags. They don't take the rosary away from you. That's one of the reasons why she gave us the rosary. It can solve all the world's problems. So that's the rosary. Pray it every day. Most of us don't pray it every day. But Our Lady came at Fatima and asked us to. So every day that I don't pray the rosary, I'm being disobedient to Our Lady. And therefore, I'm guilty for all this other conditional prophecies that may take place. Let's all pray the rosary every day without exception. C, Catholic, Roman Catholic. The C stands for the consecration. Consecrate yourself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Each one of you can do that. Fathers, you can do it for your families. Spouses, do it for your marriage. Okay, Husbands and wives should do it for their marriage. They can do it for their kids. 
And each one of us can consecrate ourselves. Consecrate yourself to the Immaculate Mary. The best method is St. Louis de Montfort's method. So you can get a book on that. But, I mean, just, just do it. Get yourself consecrated. Make that commitment. And trust yourself to her. And then, of course, don't forget to pray for the consecration of Russia. That's something you can't do. That's up to the Pope and the bishops. Uh, but we can certainly pray that they get the graces to do it. The S is the brown scapular. Our Lady indicated Fatima that she wanted everyone to wear the brown scapular. So wear the brown scapular faithfully, which also means living purity, by the way, living chastely according to your state in life. You're supposed to be invested in the brown scapular. So if you're not invested in the brown scapular, make sure you get invested in the brown scapular. Otherwise, you're not eligible for the graces that all go to the Carmelite order, which is the most ancient order dedicated to Our Lady, started by Elias the prophet. St. John the Baptist was probably connected to them. They came down when Our Lady and Our Lord, the, 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 the descendants of Elias, they built the first chapel to Our Lady among Carmel back in the time of, you know, first century. So won't go into that. There's a great book back there on the brown scapula if you want to learn more about the brown scapula. But she did show it at Fatima, indicating she wanted everyone to wear it. So wear the brown scapula faithfully. That's the S. The O is to offer prayer and penance. So every day offer prayer and penance, especially the duties of your state, little offerings. She taught a beautiful prayer. Oh, my Jesus, I offer this for love of thee, for the conversion of sinners, and for reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So you stub your toe, pray that. You hit a red light, pray that. You get cut off, pray that. Doesn't matter what happens. You know, you miss the job, you miss a promotion. Your kid's giving you a hard time. You have a headache, you get sick. You catch COVID, a, clo a flu, I don't know what. Offer it up. Just offer it up with that little prayer. So another good prayer to memorize that Our Lady taught at Fatima. That's offer prayer and penance. And then the last S is for the first Saturday. S is for Saturday. So do the first Saturday every month. Receive Holy Communion and offer in reparation for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart Mary. It really isn't that hard to live this message. And if we get enough Catholics doing this, then we will hasten that time that Russia is properly consecrated. She is then converted. Great miracles would take place like we've never seen before. And the world will have a period of peace. It's coming. It's foretold. That is inevitable. We know who wins. Let's just hasten it. May it happen soon. Thank you very much.